<clears throat> well, I pray that uh, if you had a nap this evening, it was as wonderful as the one I had. I certainly needed it. <sighs> wonderful to see you all here this evening. I want to start us off uh, this evening with uh, perhaps a definition of sorts. The, the word is dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. And it is a counselor term, and it simply means something may function, but it's not functioning properly. To give you some examples, uh, Isaac had a dysfunctional family. Esau had an agreement to trade his birthright for a bowl of soup. He thought more about this, this physical thing than being a spiritual leader for his family. He was blinded by his appetite. He was blinded by his son's spiritual immaturity. And, and all this time, his wife is behind, is trying to deceive him. She's going behind his back. Isaac's blind to his own spiritual inadequacies. Rebecca's dysfunctional in that she is willing to not only listen in on this private conversation, but she tries to take advantage. And, and Jacob himself is willing to be manipulated. Dysfunctional. Remember the first family? Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. It's not too much later, one is murdered. After the flood, Noah got drunk and cursed his own family. Abraham and Sarah lied about Abraham's identity. Jacob and Laban. Jacob spends seven years trying to marry Rachel, and Laban lies to him. And he gives, her, gives Jacob Leah instead. He was lied to by his own sons concerning the coat that he gave to his son. Eli was not the father he should have been in 1 Samuel. David's family is a complete disaster. Dysfunction happens to perhaps, we would say, even the best of families. In the book of Mark, very briefly, in, in Mark chapter 8, we see the first of three times that Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says the same thing over and over and over again. Chapter 8 and verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Chapter 9 and verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Chapter 10. In verse 33. Look. Look. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and experts 
of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him severely, and kill him. Yet after three days, he will rise again. Was Jesus a good teacher? I I think we would all shake our head, yeah. He was a good teacher. No, he was the best teacher. But, But why does he have to tell them over and over and over again the exact same thing? I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm going to die, and they just don't seem to get it. What's happening? Well, Jesus is telling them, he's telling them his prediction that I am going to die. I am going to suffer. They don't like this. They don't want anything to do with it. They, they say, oh, you're not going to die. You crazy? My, uh, I think it was my first year at Faulkner. Uh, they had just built the freshman dorms, the new freshman dorms for the guys. And this building was uh, four stories tall, and so they installed an elevator inside of it. And so as someone who lived on the fourth story, moving in was kind of a nightmare if I didn't have that elevator. And so, I appreciated this elevator. I took advantage of it because who wants to carry a bunch of junk up four flights of stairs? But this elevator came with some problems in that it broke down. So, it was frequent. I would come back from class and there was a note on the doors do not use. It's under maintenance. And it kind of, and at one point, we, we had, we had an accident where uh, one of the uh, students got trapped inside of the elevator after it broke down. He ended up falling two, two and a half stories and broke his leg. Dysfunctional. The whole situation was complete dysfunction. So, some differences that come to mind when when we think about these passages that we've just read. These are different locations. But I also have to ask the question, how do we respond to scary situations? Why does Jesus keep repeating himself? I I think we, we should certainly say that he's a good communicator. But they didn't always pick up on what he was saying. They did not understand. It was, at times, hidden from them. Watch what Peter does in chapter 8 of Mark. Verse 31, he tells them that I'm going to be killed, and after three days I'm going to rise. He spoke openly about this. And so Peter took him aside and began, and he rebuked him. Or rather, uh, he took him aside and began to rebuke him. After turning and looking at his disciples, he, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. 
Peter didn't seem to fully understand. And there are times when people are afraid of something, they kind of get tunnel vision, right? They, we don't ask for more information. We focus on that thing, and that's kind of what Peter did, right? I'm going to die. Well, no, Jesus, you're not going to die. He rebukes him. Flip over to chapter 9. Verse 31, he says, he's teaching his disciples, Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. After three days, he will rise. But they did not understand this statement and were afraid to ask him. Not only they're, they're afraid to ask him. Is, is this rising thing a metaphor? Is that what's is happening? Is he really going to die? Does this rising thing mean something else? Maybe that's the kind of questions that they're asking him. Or rather, they're asking to themselves. But they don't ask him. And so, watch what happens here in the next couple of passages. Verse 33, Then they came to Capernaum. After Jesus was inside the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they were silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. After he sat down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. He took a little child and had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Not only are these disciples arguing, bickering about, well, who's going to take his place? If he's going away, who's going to replace him? Oh, it's going to be me. No, no, it's going to be me. I'm going to be the greatest. And, and when, when asked about, well, Jesus asked them, what were you guys talking about along the way? They were ashamed to tell him the truth, disputing about who's going to take Jesus' place. He tells them over and over again, because... They don't understand. And they're not going to understand until Acts chapter 2, when they finally receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those flames that... I forget the exact wording. But these flame-like things that appear above their head. And they, the room is filled with the Holy Spirit. They receive the gift, the helper. But, it, but right even before that, before Jesus even ascends into heaven, they're still asking him about this kingdom that's going to come. They still don't understand, even after the resurrection. And so, if Jesus really knows about his disciples not understanding when he tells them, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, then, then what's the point in telling them at all for not going to understand? He's telling them because they would leave if he dies. They would quit. He is preparing their hearts and minds to get ready for this traumatic event that's about to happen. 
each time that he tells them that I'm going to die, we, we get a little bit more details as we continue reading. But also, a good teacher understands that typically people don't get things the first time that they're told. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, We'll start in verse 5, rather. What is Apollos, really? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, and each of us in the ministry the Lord gave us. I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused it to grow. So neither one who plants counts for anything, nor the one who waters, but God who causes the growth. The one who plants, the one who waters, works as one. Each will receive his reward. This, right? Maybe not. Watch what happens in Corinth, right? Paul has to go to Corinth. He is planting the seed for these Corinthian people, but he still has Apollos come behind him and continue to develop their faith, watering them, as he calls it. God who gives an increase, but Apollos comes behind him. And in Second Peter, chapter three, he says, verse one, dear friends, this is already the second letter. I have written you, in which I am trying to stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. Peter has to write a whole second letter for these individuals, giving them reminders, telling them about things that they need to remember. He's told this to them before, but I got to make sure we're on the same page. I have to remind. He's telling this to his apostles so that it is on their hearts. This is going to happen. But but when I die, this is not going to be the end of what I'm preparing. Uh, Turn with me, if you will, back to Mark chapter 10. Fear and misunderstanding lead to dysfunction. Chapter 9, we saw them bickering and arguing about who's going to be the greatest. In chapter 10, they want, they have a request. 33, look, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and experts in the law. They will condemn him to death, turn him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him severely, and kill him. Yet after three days, he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? He said to them, Permit one of us to sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink, be baptized with the baptism I experience? They said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink, 
and you will be baptized with the baptism I experience, but to sit at my right or my left is not mine to give. It is for those for whom it has been prepared. He's telling them I'm going to die. And this dysfunction comes in when they're not terribly concerned that Jesus is going to die. Peter rebukes him in chapter 8. Chapter 9 and 10, they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. They're arguing about who's going to be the next. Who's going to take over. And, And somewhat inappropriately asking that. Who's going to be the greatest? And so, and they don't have proper understanding about the whole situation. They don't ask questions about it. Powerful info without proper understanding often creates dysfunction. Because I don't understand what's happening. I don't fully understand the situation, and I'm too afraid to ask. When when I tell someone that denominationalism is a sin, I shouldn't expect them to get it on the first try. Preparing the soil... And planting the seed takes time. But sometimes we tell people things that they aren't ready for. Let them come to a realization. But those who have received this powerful info often have emotional reactions to this as well. couple of things for you, and the lesson will be yours. John chapter 16. Thank you for turning. Uh, Verse 1. I have told you all these things so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue, yet a time is coming when the one who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things, as they have not known the Father or me. But I have told you these things, so that when their time comes, you will remember that I told you about them. when, when I or you teach someone, whatever that might be, I'd probably need to be patient with people when I'm teaching them. He tells the apostles that I need to tell you these things, but I'm not quite now. You're not ready. Imagine what would happen if Jesus said, not only am I going to die, but I'm going to do away with everything you have ever known. Think about that. The temple, gone. I'm not going to synagogue on Saturday anymore. No more sacrifices, no more feast days. Imagine what a culture shock that would be if he's telling them all of this is going to happen. Oh, and I'm also going to die. They wouldn't know what to do with that. They aren't prepared for that. He's going to do away with everything they have known. He's preparing their hearts. Number two. I probably shouldn't be surprised if someone overreacts to hard news. Acts chapter 19. I 
I remember this chapter pretty well. Part of that is because uh, my Acts teacher described it as uh, if you cause a riot, Romans are going to come in. They're going to stop this riot. They're going to shoot first and ask questions later. You don't start riots. And so, verse 21 of Acts 19. After all these things had taken place, Paul resolved to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Acacia. He said, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So after sending two of his assistants, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, he himself stayed on for a while in the province of Asia. At that time, a great disturbance took place concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought a great deal of business to the craftsmen. He gathered these together along with the workmen in similar trades. He said, Men, you know that our prosperity comes from this business. And you see and hear that this Paul has persuaded and turned away a large crowd, not only in Ephesus, but in practicality all of the province of Asia, by saying that gods made by hands are not gods at all. There is danger, not only that this business of ours will come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be regarded as nothing, and she whom all the province of Asia and the world worship will suffer the loss of her greatness. When they heard this, they became enraged and began to shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with the uproar, and the crowds rushed to the theater together, dragging with them Gaius and Erastus. Aristarchus. I don't know how to pronounce these. The Macedonians who were, with, who were Paul's traveling companions. But when Paul wanted to enter the public assembly, the disciples would not let him. Even some of the province, provincial authorities who were his friends sent a message to him urging him not to venture into the theater. Paul's been preaching, right? Teaching the people about this God. This God not made with hands. The invisible God. In Mars Hill, he calls it the unknown God. And so... Demetrius here gets pretty upset, right? This is his livelihood at stake. If, if he hears, he's hearing about this way, Jesus from Nazareth, hey, if people start following him, if people stop coming to the temple, you're in my livelihood, it's gone. There's no point to what we do. And so they start a riot. They rage. The city is filled with confusion. They didn't react well to the hard news that my job's a sham. And so when, when I think about Mark chapter 8, when, when Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to die, Peter wants to keep the status quo. You're not going to die. But Peter wanting to keep the status quo here is satanic, right? Jesus tells him, get behind me. Satan, you don't see the big picture, Peter. I cannot stay the same. I've got to change. I have to change. Because Jesus insists that I die to what I want. I carry my cross. I submit to the will of Jesus. If you have any need, whatever that might be, won't you come while we stand and sing the song of invitation?